Hello, and welcome to Distillations, extracts from the past, present, and future of chemistry. I'm Mayor Rindy. On today's show, we're looking at plastics. We'll learn why every packaged product contains traces of its wrapping, and we'll speak with a former DuPont chemist who helped develop the wrap for our supermarket roasts. That's all coming up on today's episode of Distillations. Plastics can be thick or thin, rigid or flexible. They can form almost any shape and can serve as furniture, car parts, even clothing. Plastic has traditionally been made from petroleum, but now some new ingredients are entering the mix, most notably corn. Versatile corn has been part of the American diet for centuries. It's recently become part of our car's diet as corn ethanol, and now it's being turned into plastic. This kind of plastic is called polylactic acid, or PLA. It's made from lactic acid, which comes from all kinds of starchy foods, including wheat, beets, sugarcane, and soy. These compostable plastics show great promise for the environment, but all plastic has its limits. Jennifer Dionisio has more in today's Chemical Agent. As far back as the 19th century, scientists knew how to convert lactic acid into PLA, but the process was too inefficient to make it worthwhile. It wasn't until 1989 that a chemist found a cheap way to turn the starch and food into plastic. PLA soon became a marketable commodity, and it's now used to make clothing fibers, biomedical sutures, food packaging, and plates, knives, and forks. According to the EPA, manufacturing PLA is twice as energy efficient as making oil-based plastics. Consider that traditional petroleum-based plastic packing in the U.S. consumes 200,000 barrels of oil per day. PLA consumes none. In 2002, NatureWorks, the company that makes PLA, won the EPA's Green Reaction Award for the industrial process that turns corn-based lactic acid into PLA. The manufacturing process uses little energy, recycles byproducts, and uses water instead of toxic solvents. PLA production also uses less fuel and releases fewer greenhouse gases than the production of traditional plastics. Producing PLA may be more environmentally friendly than ordinary plastics, but take its composting claims with a grain of salt. It turns into compost only in particular commercial facilities. Throw PLA onto your backyard compost heap and the plastic will just sit there. Also, while the average municipal recycling center handles recyclable oil-based plastics perfectly well, PLA gums up the works. It can't be recycled into bottles or truck liners because oil-based and corn-based plastics cannot be processed together. So we can now eat corn with silverware made from corn on a plate made from corn. But until recycling practices catch up, throwing away PLA will have the same effect as throwing away traditional plastics more trash. And that's it for The Chemical Agent. I'm Jennifer Dionisio. Jennifer Dionisio is Distillation's assistant producer. We're used to worrying about what's in our food and drink, but we don't often consider how our food and drink is packaged. Plastic, glass, cardboard, and aluminum are all used to make containers and to protect food from contamination. We unwrap or unscrew or rip open the packaging, take out the food, and throw away the unwanted container. But that container may have left something behind. Michal Meyer has more in today's Chemistry in Your Cupboard. Plastic is everywhere, wrapped around frozen vegetables, fresh meat, and many medicines. And while this artificial coating is meant to protect us, Super-sensitive instruments have detected microscopic amounts of left-behind packaging in our foods. It turns out that everything leaches. One of the most controversial types of leachables in plastics is phthalates, which are used to soften plastic and make it malleable. Some phthalates can disrupt the proper workings of certain hormones in the human body. As a result, the United States has restricted several of these chemicals in plastic toys for children. Glass containers are often considered a safe bet, but even they can leave their mark on food, leaching tiny amounts of minerals or metals. The rubber stoppers and seals on glass or plastic jars are especially harmful. 
leaching chemicals left over from processing the rubber. Even ink on the outside of a cardboard or plastic box can seep through to the food inside. In 2005, a mass recall of an infant formula was ordered in Europe after a chemical in the ink leached into the product. Preventing all leaching from packaging material is impossible. Instead, scientists are focusing their efforts on figuring out how much is leaching out of different kinds of packaging, how different chemicals interact, and what level of leaching is safe. And to make things more difficult for scientists, not much is known about how some of these leached chemicals act in the body. Since the chemical found in the European infant formula was never intended for human consumption, little research had been done on its biological effects. Of course, packaging keeps out the microorganisms that spoil foodstuffs and cause food poisoning. No one recommends discarding the barriers that protect us from these pathogens. Instead, companies reduce leaching by changing what goes into their packaging. We'll always need something to put our food and medicines in. And that means we'll always get more than we expect. For Distillations, I'm Mikhail Meyer. Michal Meyer is executive producer of Distillations. We have more information on food packaging and safety on our website, distillations.chemheritage.org. You're listening to Distillations. I'm Mayor Rindy. One of the most ubiquitous forms of plastic packaging is the barrier wrap that keeps meat fresh and juicy looking in supermarket display cases. To learn more about how this plastic wrap was developed, I talked to our own Bob Kenworthy, a chemist who was director of marketing for DuPont's flexible packaging business. Bob, thanks for coming in to speak with us today. You're quite welcome. I'm happy to be here. I want to start by asking you, what is barrier packaging? Well, Mayor, there's two reasons why food is packaged. One is just decorative to display the product commercially, but the more important one is functional, to protect the food from bacterial infection or from uh, oxidation or, or degradation in one way or another. Generally, that functional packaging is referred to as barrier packaging because it stops things like bacteria, water, and oxygen from getting to the product. And what we're talking about here, for people who aren't familiar with the idea, is the generally the clear plastic that you see wrapping products uh, in the supermarket. Isn't that right? Yeah. Today's technology for food marketing uh, requires that it be packaged flexibly rather than in uh, metal cans or, or rigid glass jars, as uh, some older packaging was uh, arranged. So for the most part, in a display case in a grocery store, you want to have the food, uh, particularly when we're talking about meat and meat products, you know, cut in the way that it's going to be cooked by the homeowner uh, uh, and then uh, displayed in an attractive way so that they say, oh, wow, I want to have that for dinner. And, of course, it protects the meat, keeps it in good condition so people can take it home and it's still good for use. Correct. From a store owner's point of view, uh, there's a concept called shelf life, which is to say how long can you keep that product on the shelf in the grocery store before you sell it and still have it be safe and attractive to the consumer. Some products, particularly fresh meat, uh, in the absence of, of good functional packaging, you have maybe a day, two days at the most, uh, of shelf life. Whereas with good uh, barrier packaging, you can extend that up to a week or two. So it's a real economic uh, benefit for the store owner. And those wraps that we see in the store, they're actually made of several layers or different kinds of plastic? Correct. There, there is no one polymer that does everything that needs to be done to, uh, to protect meat. So for the most part, it would be a, a three-layer, five-layer, or even seven-layer co-extruded film where one layer would provide the bulk uh, structural properties, give it enough strength to stay together. Another layer would provide the barrier, keeping oxygen, water, and and, uh, uh, microorganisms away from the meat. And then the third layer would provide sealability. So, you know, after you wrap it up, you want to have a way that it actually shrinks down to conform to the meat and and seals around the meat uh, so that you don't have gaps and leaks. I understand that there are some plastic wraps that are designed to breathe, actually. Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. Uh, the best barrier films, uh, particularly for red meat, 
uh, keep oxygen away from it almost completely. And if you look at the chemistry of hemoglobin, the, the red of red meat, uh, oxygen is required to give that uh, molecule its bright red color. If you keep oxygen away from it, it turns a very, very deep purple. And that very, very deep purple, if you look at it from a distance, is very hard to, for the human eye to distinguish between that color of purple and brown. And everybody knows that brown meat is bad meat. So for the most part, if, if we displayed meat with really great barrier wrapping around it, it would look like it had already spoiled and it wouldn't sell very well. So a lot of work went into the technology of having very good barrier films for the transportation and distribution of the fresh meat from the slaughterhouse to the grocery store. But then once it got to the grocery store, you could actually peel that barrier layer off and expose the meat with a more porous film so that oxygen would get to the hemoglobin and the meat would bloom red and look like beautiful, fresh red meat. Well, Bob Kenworthy, thanks very much for coming in to speak with us today. It's my pleasure. I really enjoy being here. Bob Kenworthy is the former director of marketing for DuPont's flexible packaging business. He's now the manager of affiliate relations at CHF. And that's a wrap for this week's episode of Distillations. Distillations is a presentation of the Chemical Heritage Foundation. Our show is produced by Michal Meyer, Mia Lobel, Victoria Indeviro, and Jennifer Dionisio. Our theme music is composed and performed by Dave Kaufman. Additional music provided from the Podsafe Music Network. Please tell us what you think about our program and send suggestions for future shows to distillations at chemheritage.org. Until next time, I'm Mayor Rindy. <laughs>